presentation. Um, for we who for we who scribble and write, um, uh, there's nothing sort of more gratifying really than when what you do amounts amounts to something, um, because books disappear very quickly into the wind. Um, I'm working on a book now actually called When Words Fail, which is about music. It's a quote from Samuel Beckett. What shall we do when words fail? And um, I think when it comes to a place like Juarez, words usually do fail. Um, and if you don't, if you can't write music, you make movies. I mean, and all we writers <laughs> um, would like, of course, are books to be optioned and to be given some money and made into best-selling films and, and, um, and all that. But uh, I think real journalism and real filmmaking doesn't occupy that planet, really. And I mean it when I say that um, even to be indirectly associated with that masterpiece is, you know, for me, a, a great, a great honour, Mark. Um, well, thanks, Ed. It's, in a way, it's a gift. No, I don't we, have, we, we do work in a gift economy. There's not I mean, much money in this game. I'll so I'll it's explain. my gift to you. <laughs> Hardly. Well, no, one, no one's ever given me a better one. Because uh, this photograph, which you won't be able to see, but it's, it's a great picture by a guy called Julian Cardona, who's a great photographer working in Juarez, still living there. And this was in Ed's book in Mexico, and this was the photograph, as well as the chapter in Ed's book, called The Human Junkyard, which was about the asylum, which led me to the place. So, in a way... Um, you know, you hear about things, and it's the closing of another circle, having Ed here and, uh, and giving it back, because you gave something to me. And, uh, well, it's amazing. Now, Julian, you've mentioned. Now, the, some, there is some housekeeping to do. Um, first of all, uh, we need to mention Julian Cardona, without whom I would not have been able to get to that place in the first place in Juarez when I was doing the book in 2008, and without whom I don't think I say this presumptuously you know, you, you, you could have done what you did. Uh, this is an extraordinary man. The name might not be familiar to you, but his work is, because his picture of the woman um, posted on the wall of a place called the House of Death in Juarez, where the bullet shot through her mouth, is what you see when you come up the stairs of this club. So regulars here know Julian's work extremely well. Um, in fact, the same picture is even now I see on the menus, which... Uh, in this club's best tradition of respecting the copyright of our colleagues seems to be proliferating. We must make Julian aware of this, I think. And the second sort of person uh, to pay tribute to is indeed the, the dedicatee of the, of the film, Charles Bowden, who is the kind of guru of we who attempted at some point or other what is known, I think, as border writing, um, who died last year. And uh, this brings us to our... His words did not fail, by the way, which brings us to, our, to, the, to the questions and the discussion with Mark and then later with you all, I hope. Um, we do a lot of stuff here. Syria, ISIS, the rest, uh, Sudan, Africa. But there's something about Mexico and what is happening in Juarez, and what is happening on the so-called narco war, which for those of you who, who, who are not familiar with it, um, you know, we're now talking about 120,000 or so dead, 20,000 missing, and a war hasn't even been declared. There's something about it which is, for those of, who's, the, those of us who have tried to, to, to grapple with it, is sort of more important than all of it, because it's about all of us, because it's not, just a, it's, it's not about over there or about here, it is, as the great painter Brian Maguire put it so well when he went to paint the portraits of the murdered women in Juarez. It, Juarez is, and what you've been looking at on the film, is the carburetor under your car. It is the, the electronics in your mobile phone. It's all made, if not there, in places like that. Charles Bowden put it differently. Um, he said that Ciudad Juarez is not a breakdown of the social order. It is, Juarez is the new order. I mean, well, that's Chuck, bless him, with his inimitable mix of alcohol and apocalypse. Um, but he's on to something. He's right, I think. So the first question, really, to Mark, is this whole thing of sort of them and us, really. Um, you know, we are here in London, 
And I do often think, when I came back from that place, I was often on the un London Underground. Yeah. Please move along the platform now, please, planned engineering works. Again. And the people are all there with their lanyards and their iPads. No, who's mad? Them or them? Um, well, both. Uh, 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 but there is, I mean, it is the carburetor under their cars. It is the, 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 the electronics in there nodding eye iPod on a fucking district line when it fails again. Um, it is the, it is the, the, the equipment. So, so this idea that we're not watching another world, are we, Mark? We're watching very much a part of our lives. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's many, many definitions of, of, of us and them. Um, I think most people are familiar with that, that, that phrase. Uh, I picked that quote at the top of the film because um, when Chuck says, but, but in the country of the dead, the line dissolves between us and them. And, you know, he's talking about Juarez, he's talking about Mexico. And I, I think as well, it's a, it's a trope that's it's a very, very strong thread in, 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 in our world about, which, which kind of contains us in the sense that, well, we're better off than them. Them over there, they're, they're all killing each other. You should be happy, you should be um, uh, content with what you've got. And of course, politicians, governments use it. Charities use it. Um, please give to them because they need your help, they need your pity. And one thing I learned, one very profound thing I learned from the experience of making that film was that the more I worked with those people, the more I realized that actually uh, I was learning a lot from them because how would you or I cope living in a place like that? How would we, would we survive Juarez, let alone would we survive that asylum? You saw Josue arriving in that place, he looked like a scared rabbit. And uh, to, to confront all that and get through it uh, and then still smile who, who, who around here can do that? You know, so I was humbled by them. So to start thinking that we're okay and uh, them over there somehow need our charity is complete bullshit. It's, it's, we should be humbled by them. We should admire them. So these starving people who are getting through the day with, you know, by constantly thinking about when they're going to have a meal, these are, these are survivors. They could teach us a few things. You know, we're, we're just more fortunate. That's the only difference. So this us and them dichotomy of uh, us somehow being superior because we're comfortable is all, all back to front. It's the wrong way around. So that's what they taught me. I mean, the, 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 I mean, the human junkyard, as I called it, um, I mean, as you, you've just explained why is, it is. Is your mic the right way around? Ed? Am I plugged in, or does it matter if I'm not? Oh, um, no, the people anyway. in the back might. Uh, I'll, I'll. Can you hear? Can you hear? Okay. Oh. Is, is this it? Does that work? Is that better? Sorry, I'm so sorry. Um, the uh, the human junkyard. I mean, as you've just said, sort of isn't really a junkyard. I mean, you know, the. Where, who is the junk? Well, the pastor calls um, it a recycling centre, yes, a recycling yes, yes, yes. centre of but, human trash. But the, um, you know. I mean, the point I was trying to get, yeah, the, the, I think, the thing is that the, the economy of Ciudad Juarez is, they're called the Magiladoras, uh, assembly plants that basically make the phantasmagoria and the crap that our society in America thinks it needs. Um, a you know, a different TV set every so often, a, a new bit of this, a new bit of that. Um, a, 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 a generations of telephones that need constantly replacing, supposedly. Um, I mean, do talk a bit about, I mean, Juarez, I mean, the place within the city is basically the, the it is the residue of that system, isn't it? It is the, re it is the residue of, a, of, a, of a, a place that attracted assembly plants um, for reasons to do with the, with the with the economy of the United States, well, it's, um, it's, yeah, and it's they're something. the residue of that. Y you know it better and, than and I do. And yet we consume it. I mean, that's the other line. That's why there is no them or us. I mean, you know, yeah. we are. They are. They make us, and we use them. Yeah, yeah. And I think internally in Mexico, as far as I know, it works like that as well, because there's parts of Juarez that uh, are quite normal. There's gated communities. They're fortresses. Uh, the like of which I've only seen in South Africa. Um, and there are definitely parallels between those two countries. And the, uh, my last one was about 
fear in South Africa, so that drew me to Mexico, and so it's no coincidence. But um, so this, this, this kind of normal middle class people go to the shops, drive their car, but under under fortification, um, and in a way, it's yeah, they're a microcosm of of the outside <laughs> world as well. But it's the same thing. I mean, yeah, we make each other, you know, and uh, you know these. I, I, I think there's, the, there's an ignorance, there's a blindness, which is phenomenal, you know. But I've just shown the film in San Francisco. I've never seen... I'm, I was just thinking, maybe in Calcutta, but I, I don't remember if it was as bad. But I've never seen so many disturbed homeless people on the streets than I have in San Francisco. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, and yet and I'd commented to people, and because I was new there, I, I, it, was, it, was, it really stood out. But everybody said, oh, really? They didn't... They kind of knew about it, but they weren't, they'd lost touch with it. Juarez is, is an addictive place. I mean, I kind of been sort of slightly out of action after an accident for a couple of years. And finally, when the doctor said you can fly a long distance, I took a, a, my first week's holiday in Ciudad Juarez. I, um, I mean, I wanted to see the crew again. I wanted to see the gang. Um, it is addictive. Do tell us about, about showing the film there. I mean, San Francisco is one thing, but uh, Mark, did show that he showed the film to the people in it. Do tell us about that. Well, that was, I mean, it's the kind of place, I mean, throughout the whole shoot, I, I had expectations and, uh, you know, with documentaries, the, the, the mythology goes that you sit there and wait for things to happen and, um, you know, eventually the action comes to you. Uh, that luxury doesn't, it's, it's very rare if, if it exists at all. So you. You've got to kind of set things up. You've got to make things happen. Um, sometimes things happen. Sometimes things don't. So I, I had an idea that I would show the film under the stars in the patio with all the patients there, and uh, it would have a certain atmosphere. That was in my head. As it turned out, we showed it during the day in a room. Not everybody was there who I wanted to be there. But <laughs> as ever, I kind of sat there and thought, well, uh, you should be happy with what you get. At least you're here. And Estella, the, the woman you see having a fit in the cell, it's, qu it's quite a disturbing scene. She was just grinning all the time when she was watching the film. And she, she has this um, manic condition. Uh, and she annoys a lot of people all of the time. But she was, um, she was really enthralled by it. Elia, the woman you see at the end with a big smile on her face, that very long shot right towards the end of the film, she had lost her sister. Letitia, who uh, you also see in the film, who blows a kiss right at the end, and she falls down in one scene and she cries. I don't know if you remember that, but she uh, she since died, and I was told that uh, by other people that she hadn't, Elia hadn't recognised that her sister had died. Um, so, and in very Mexican fashion, because it's not just Juarez, but there is this kind of strange kind of sadism in Mexican culture where if people suffering they maybe it's a Catholic thing as well but they really rub their noses in it so while the film was showing Elia was watching the film supposedly unaware that her sister was dead and then her sister appears in the film and then people from the asylum are point grabbing her and pointing at the screen as if to say look there's your sister she's dead and she didn't Yikes. acknowledge it yeah. but it, it, it just reminded me of the mystery of these people and they don't really know that she hasn't recognized her sister as dead. And they don't know if she recognized her sister on this. You just don't know. And I'll just tell you a little story about these, because they were sisters. And uh, they were found chained up to the floor. Their parents were drug addicts, and they had, uh, they'd, they'd abandoned them. And as, as kids, they'd never been taught how to speak. So can you, you imagine your parents not even teaching you how to speak? And they ended up in the asylum. And so they're both very damaged, but, yeah. How did Josue react to it? Well, Josue I mean, was... Especially the kind of intimacy of the scene with the, the reunion with his daughter. I mean, you know, with Vanessa, you're... Well, how did she react? I mean, you, you know, you, it's father meets daughter with all that, and there's a camera at the back of the motel room. <laughs> how did they react to that? Well, that whole thing was very strange because... Uh, I was the catalyst for their reunion, uh, and not by choice. I'd never been in that position before, and uh, they didn't they didn't really want to meet. She didn't really want to meet him because she was scared, and I don't blame her. I mean, it's not in the film, but the guy was in San Quentin for 10 years for murder with, with Charles Manson. 
Um, and that was when they caught him. I mean, he did a lot of other shit that he didn't get caught for. Uh, and, and that wasn't enough to, to reform him. And then he, he, he ended up in that asylum years later. So a scary man, um, but found something else in his heart that, um, that was a bit more useful. So she, she didn't want to meet him. Um, so I had to push them together. And it was partly because I thought, well, they found each other through the film, so I felt obliged to, to put them together, but also I thought, this is part of the film. So it was, it, was, mm. it was a funny kind of combination. She hasn't seen it yet, but with him, I mean, he's just, he's very grateful, but then also, what would any of us do if somebody made a film about our lives? It would be quite weird, I think, you know? Exactly. And <laughs> the, the great thing about Jose is that he, he's... He is what he is, and I think it, he comes through very strongly in the film. He's very reflective. He's a poet, nothing less than a poet. Um, none of that was scripted. He just came out with those lines. Um, I, I, I've recorded hours with him, uh, and that's, uh, there's, there's, there's a lot more besides. I mean, you can't put it all in one film. But he, uh, he, the, the good news is that he's now studying to be a mental health nurse, so he, which is what he is. But he's, he's now going to get the official stamp, so he can use that. I mean, the Pasteur wants to own a, open up a, a chain of a franchise of asylums along the, along the line. <laughs> and if this was a Hollywood version, you'd have Josue... Uh, you'd have Josue um, playing with his grandchildren, running the franchise, but, um, <laughs> but it's not. And um, I, th I thought it was very important not to use the daughter as, as a big... Uh, to, to propel a big theme of redemption, because I don't believe in redemption. I, I, I think it's nonsense. And the fact is, he goes back there, and he's still there. And it was great to see him, and um, you know, we embraced. But I, I don't think he knew what to say, and I don't blame him. You know? The issue of redemption is this is is interesting because um, I thought your your film was quite redemptive actually, because of the dancing at the end and his great line, "I survived all this garbage." Yeah. And it is about survival, if not redemption. And I'm interested in the whole issue of sort of religion, because um, I mean, there's you know the, the the huge character who's sort of present in in the story but not in the film is Jesus, or, and the and the Virgin here and the well, Madonna Jose, of, Joshua, and the and Jesus, the and the, yeah. and the and the and the Madonna of Guadalupe. And it's interesting because. The media, the press, the way you know, we don't we don't do religion. I don't want to. God, I never said sound like Alistair fucking Campbell, but you know, we don't. It, it's difficult. To, and when I was there, it, I, you know, it was. I decided not. To, I decided just to open the gates. Really, I mean, I'll talk about Jesus and the version of Guadalupe as much as they want to, because that's the reality. Um, but you left the religion out. Was that to sort of make it palatable to? Secular audience, or was that because well, it would know, get in the S way? S or Sibylla here, I don't know. Sibylla's made it the editor. Um, um, I'm just interested in why, because I find it kind of impossible. I found it impossible. Uh, you know, you had to just go with the flow. Uh, but I think there is there. And I spent many nights with Josue, and there is know, religion. sometimes I got quite scared when he was going weird. You know, um, <laughs> but you know, he's he's fantastic and um, it, very impressive. But but you know, but it is about Jesus. And I wondered why you sort of chose to kind of keep Jesus out of it. Well, I, <laughs> sorry, I'm not trying to make it okay. difficult. I just, it's interesting. No, it's a good, it's a good question. And I, um, I, I, in my previous film, I, I had a similar problem. The word Jesus came up a lot, and uh, I have this censorship button. Don't, I, because I, I've got a real problem with evangelical whatever, whether it be politics, religion, anybody trying to convert anybody. I find problematic because basically they're saying we're right and you're wrong until you agree with us and then you're right, and 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 wars of you know as you know, so um, absolutely I had the censorship button with with Jesus, but um, at the same time remember the first bits of dialogue in the film are Good Morning Jesus, Buenos Dias mm. Jesus, uh, when when Josué says Good morning to the guy who's hiding under a blanket who can only squeal who's actually eating his own shit, um, and. So the, the editor and I, who's Catalan, also brought up in a Catholic country, and uh, we chuckled. Well, she really liked that fact that the first lines were, Good morning, Jesus. But um, 
But I think there is, there's a, uh, what I do like is that there's a lot of Catholic um, iconography in the film. There's, of course, the Di Diablo, which goes to the square. That was huge. Um, that was, that was a fire, wonderful scene. There's fire and there's the phoenix rising, and Josue constantly rising from the flames, from the opening shot, and it's, it's a motif yes, that exactly, carries on. Exactly. And so, and I think the Catholics are very good at this, and it's, it's the one thing I like about Catholicism is, is, is the, the imagery. You know, um, it beats the Protestants hands down. You know, I mean, well, Mexican. I mean, Catholicism in Mexico is uh, syncretismo. It's called. It's, I mean, it's very. It's kind of overlaid with a lot of ancient stuff, and it gets all mixed up in that way that Condomble does in Brazil. No, but I just thought it was interesting that. that, that uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was, I didn't, I, 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 I didn't. I mean, with the pastor as well, because. One of the reasons why he's hardly in the film at all is because whenever we filmed him, he just started making speeches. He's a street preacher, but he just started going on about um, Jesus. And, uh, and the problem I have with it is that they, um, if something good happens, they thank Jesus. If something bad happens, they say, well, it's Jesus. So, and I thought, Josue should take some credit for what he's done. It's, yeah. Jesus didn't do that. He did it. Exactly. So you can't thank Jesus. He should thank himself, you know. <laughs> the, the issue of, um, I mean, th this is slightly beyond the parameters of the film, but it's irresistible um, because you do, you know, you open with Charles Bowden's quote about them and us. I mean, in the big backdrop to this, and we can say this, don't worry about the broadcast, they've admitted it. I mean, this is about drugs in many ways. I mean, Juarez, it's the, Ciudad Juarez, the city in, in which this is filmed, is the, it's the center point of the borderline, the 2,000 uh, miles of, uh, of the frontier. It's the heart of the book, it's the heart of the borderland. Uh, um, historically, though not actually literally anymore, that would be Nuevo Laredo and Laredo in Texas, but historically it is the fulcrum of the smuggling trade in alcohol and now drugs between Mexico and the USA. Um, I mean, one of the things that sort of, you know, that makes it not them and us is that this is ultimately, I mean, I think what's so interesting about the, the, the war in Mexico is it, it is 21st century because it's about nothing, absolutely nothing. I mean, what's happening in the Middle East is a, is a war about religion. We've been doing that for a long time, supposedly religion. Bosnia genocide, good twentieth, good twentieth century war, if you like. But Mexico has this kind of nihilism about it's about nothing. If it's about anything, it's about money. Who has admitted laundering the profits of what you've been watching in that film? Well, they're called Wachovia, a subsidiary of Wells Fargo. They're called HSBC. Don't worry, they've admitted it. You won't hear from their lawyers. Um, I mean, this seems to be the sort of the huge you know, why it's not them and us, why we are them. The money out of that misery is being spent on the golf courses of Connecticut and the wine bars of Holland fucking park and Canary Wharf. Now, that's a big issue. I mean, I know it's not in your film. No, I have an but, HSBC but you, account. But you don't have to, <laughs> but you don't have to know very much. You don't have to have read very much. All you have to do is read the headlines of the Daily Mail if you're that desperate to know that this is the case. Why do you think there is still this great sort of abyss, you know? Well, it's our healthy democracy and their dusty country, which you portray so beautifully, by the way, in your images of desert and wind and rubbish and, you know, something, you know, this kind of abyss that you and I spend our lives trying to cross, trying to tell people, this is you and you are it. They are you, you are them, with your HSBC card. With well, your, I mean, with, you know, nobody ever seems to stop and say, oh, it's, it's, a, it's another Kate Moss cocaine scandal, oh, isn't it? But how many fucking lives went up Kate Moss's nose? I mean, why this great kind of abyss? Why do people think, oh, we're watching this, this sort of horrifically exotic, distant place in Ciudad de Juarez? Well, actually, it is our lives, it is our mobile phone, it is the HSBC card, it is the line of coke up Kate Moss's nose. Why, why, why? Well, why why big, can't you and big, I? It's a big question. Then. Yeah, but it's the but it is the question. I don't know if I have the answer, but I think dividing and ruling is one thing. I mean, if if we're constantly told that we're different and the trouble is over there and not here, mm. uh, 
then it makes us feel better. And I mean, an, an election is just... I've been away for six weeks, so um, it's my first day back under, un, under a new Tory government. And uh, clearly an election won on, on, on fear, you know. And most elections are won on fear. There's very, if they're won on hope. It's, it's a rare thing, you know. You can count them on, on probably two hands. So, yeah, it's maintaining that fear is, is very much to do with, well, look at them over there, you know. They're, 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 they're falling off boats trying to get to Italy from Africa. They, they're murdering each other um, in the streets of Juarez, you know. Lucky, lucky it's not you. Be grateful for what you've got, you know. But um, why do you think we have such difficulty in, in, in sort of in connecting the in, two? In connecting it, yes. I mean, your film, we wish it well. I, I hope it wins all the prizes. But you know, nobody bought. It's that. actually been rejected a lot. Exactly. Yeah. And and and, and I think that's why. And we don't talk enough, to be honest, in this club about you know why is your film only here and nowhere else? Um, because we don't like to grapple with that. You know. Um, you know. I mean, God, I just about broke even with a Mexican. You know, just. Um, it's this difficulty we have of, you know... You... Well, that's why I chose to... I mean, I could have made many films out of this, and uh, most films that come out of Juarez are sensationalist. Most films are about violence and murder. Uh, some of them are interesting. Most of them are just gratuitous. Yes. And... Uh, One of them had I, Jennifer I thought, Lopez. God why not? I mean, well, it wasn't... I didn't choose it, but... You know, films choose you, and when I arrived there, within a couple of days of working there, I started overcoming my own fears, which what kept kept me there. I wanted to know what I was scared of, and I realised that um, I was scared because I thought I was different. As soon as I started realising that, no, I'm not different, and I could learn something from these people, that connected me even more and, 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 and kind of spurred me on. And then I, I just I realised that, uh, you know, this, yeah, this... There's nothing to be scared mm -hmm. of, you know, um, and it, it's, it is the sheer humanity of these people, the warmth. There, there was a currency there, I call it a currency of smiles. Pe so many people smile at you all the time, every day, and you, they smile at you and you give a smile back and then you get another bigger one back and you think, Christ, what do you got to smile about? <laughs> but they just keep giving them back and so you're always in debt and you realise that, uh, <laughs> you know, you... you, you, you this, this, it's just wonderful. The humanity of these people is amazing. Mm, exactly. So exactly. that's the connection. So um, it's yeah, it's this fallacy that we're, that we're different. Yes. You know? Which brings me to a last question before we open it up. Um, I always think that you know, sort of asking artists about meta stuff is often terribly unfair. Artists like talking about colour and, and how they make paints. Just the, the actual, the art is at the craftsmanship of the film, the portrayal of the desert. You didn't give a single millimetre to kind of the romance. You, the light was there, but you did get the menace, especially towards the end. Um, the wind, the garbage, the, uh, the, the bird that sort of doesn't land on the branch, it gets, it gets the hell out of there. Um, <laughs> and, and that's very rare. I think a lot of, sort of desert, desert drug, narco, breaking bad kind of stuff. It, 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 it oozes every drop of honey and toffee it can get out of the damn thing. But the desert is a scary place and you get that. How did you set about doing basically the desert and the faces? Because I think we've sort of, I feel like we've seen, you know, a thousand Caravaggios tonight almost. How a thousand Caravaggios, well, yeah. how much do I owe you? Well, a hundred. <laughs> Uh, and amazing faces, don't you think? I mean, everybody yeah. just sort of extraordinary portraiture in the film. Well, the desert, I'd only ever seen deserts that were very pristine and clean and open. And I've always loved deserts because uh, I grew up in South Africa, so as a kid, I'd go through the Karoo Desert and it's just, it's just, it's a mind cleaner. It just empties your head and it fills your head with ideas that, um, are very fleeting, they come and go. It's a bit like being on acid, but you don't have a come down. And it's wonderful, but you go to the desert in Juarez and it's full of junk and clothes, and like you see in the film. And not only that... Dead women. But there is, there's a mystery with all deserts because of the emptiness, but it, the, des the Chihuahua Desert there, it's in a way even a greater mystery because you see all this, these remnants of people, and you don't see any people. 
So you think, what mm. has gone on here? Well, why have they abandoned everything? Who lived here? Um, how come these tapias, these uh, empty houses, these shells are, are, are for sale? Who's going to buy them? It's just a very mysterious environment. And that scarecrow you see, I mean, that wasn't set up. Mm. That, that figure impaled on, on a pole there yep. that the dogs uh, And the doll hanging from the, from the wire, the telegraph wire. Yeah. yeah. Um, that, no, that was in Juarez. Mm. But the, the, this kind of figure that was impaled on something, was, that was just in the desert outside the asylum. So it was a very, very mysterious yeah. place. Yes. And, and Peludo, uh, one of the dogs, he came back one day with, with a human arm in his mouth. And uh, he got on the local news for that. Because there's lots of shallow graves around there. I didn't actually find any, luckily, but, um, but uh, they, they, yeah, bodies are just chucked there. How about the faces? Because and the faces... I mean, if there's one thing, I think, you know, I could have... If, if there's a criticism, it's that sometimes I felt, sometimes you, you left the faces almost too quickly. I mean, they're so expressive and they're so... The, 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 that mixture of sort of poignancy and madness but yet not madness in those faces. I mean, I, I could have, you could, there were faces in there you could look at for, a, for longer even than you allowed. How did you, I suppose, they, that you just... Well, the first day I got in there, um, I, I, I was, first shoot I was on my own, and I got into the patio, and I mean, I'd just been shown the place. I, I got there at night, and I got up in the morning, and I thought, well, I'm here to work, so I went out in the patio with a camera, and I thought, right, um, I need somebody to watch my back. I don't feel safe here. So I asked one of the helpers, can you just keep an eye on me? Within about 10 minutes, he was off doing something else. He had, obviously had more important things to do, so I just had to get on with it. And then, you know, slowly it evolved. Every day was different, but I realized that there was only one person ever who complained about me filming. But I also realized I had a huge responsibility because Unlike all of us, um, those people are extremely uninhibited, very raw. They haven't really got the capacity to say, no, fuck off, don't film me, or who are you, or give us some money or anything. I mean, they might stare at you, or they might just be completely oblivious to a camera st stuck in their face. But, I, you know, I thought, okay, I've got to deal with this because I don't want people... I don't, I don't, I don't want to just be a voyeur here. I have to do something with this and show them in a particular way. Um, so the whole thing about ethics and exploitation and everything comes into play. But one, one fantastic thing for a filmmaker um, was that uh, people, a lot of, most people tended to repeat their actions. So you get somebody walking around in circles and you get the shot and you think, well, that was okay. Oh, they're doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> and again and again and again. And, and, so, and then also the, 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 the way the place runs is that every day, um, they have a routine, and like all of us, we need routines to kind of keep our heads together. And so every day they do these routines. So every day I film the same thing, the same people, and I could film it in different ways. And then once I'd exhausted it, then I, I would move on. So they were just great subjects to film, albeit um, very mysterious. Mm. So on the one hand, they were a lot easier to film than most people. On the other hand, um, I had this challenge of trying to explain who the hell they are, where they are, and of course that's one of the reasons why it was such a hard film to make, is to contextualise it. Yeah, wonderful to film, and wonderful to, irresistible to write. I mean, it's, you know, Hogarth goes to Mexico, I mean, Zola goes to the desert, I mean, it's... Uh, well, it's without Hos way, I mean... It's, it's the, the fascination of the mad, and, yeah. and, and, the, and the attraction, the madness in yourself, that, it's all that, isn't it? Or is it? Yeah, well, it was, and um, I, I, the, the book's called Asylum from the Madness because I think the real madness is, is outside in, in, in Juarez of people killing each other over drugs and money. Um, and the and pastor, the, you know, in a way, the kind of the invisible hero of the whole thing, not an easy... Yeah, he, I mean, you know, he, he, he does make that quite clear in the book. You know, he says, you know, well, you know, if you think this, if you think this is crazy, you know... What's what's it, what's what is Juarez, where they go and you know, machine gun recovering addicts uh, and 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 chop up young factory girls and like leave them in the trash? Do, what, do, is do there we, a whistle? Is there a time on this? Because I mean, if you start getting bored out there, do do yeah, let we should us know. Let people ask questions. Should we ask some questions? Would that be how many? What have you got? 
We've got 15 minutes, but I'm sure we can probably squat for longer if you want to. Questions through... Mark, hi, Tim Emmett. A, a very haunting, I think, and, and memorable film, and thank you for, uh, for sharing it with us this evening. question I've got is, if you were making a film like that in the UK, you'd inevitably come up against the NHS, local government, all sorts of government agencies, the Department of Health. Um, you probably wouldn't have come up against or, or had anything to do with the Catholic Church and the actual patients running the, uh, running the show. Um, where are all the state agencies in obviously a failed environment in this? They didn't seem to feature in any any way, shape, or form. Uh, well, it, where where are the state agencies? Mm. Uh, there there is a psychiatric hospital in Juarez. It has thirty five beds, and it's mainly empty because um, people can't afford to go there. That's it. And then you saw the police scene. Uh, where Josue really directed that scene. Now, he was he was fantastic in that scene. Um, and he kind of, you know, he lectured the police and, uh, and also told us how this place runs. Um, the main thing about the police in that scene, I, it's, we ended up cutting it out, but um, they actually tell him that, they, that he shouldn't allow us to film him because it's going to show him in a bad light. Now, these are the municipal police who work in a city the size of Nottingham where eight people are murdered every day and no one is ever arrested. And they're telling him that he's not qualified to do his job. So the state agencies, such as they are, um, are actually running the economy, which is a, 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 a crim criminal-based economy. People talk about legalizing drugs. Um, I think, in a way, drugs are legal there because it's the state and the politicians who are running a narco state. So, um, yeah. and if you call the cops, um, if something goes wrong, if s somebody's broken into your house or something, you know, somebody's been kidnapped or something, you're likely to be murdered by the cops. So you don't call the cops, you know. So this, it's, it's a really upside down world. Well, I think the question raises a very interesting issue, which we probably haven't got time to go into now. Is that there is a way in which, in journalism, and, it's, and it's a, it, you know, it is a lazy thing, it's much easier, actually, to make a film like that in a sort of distant other place than, I mean, you know, when was the last time you saw a really good film about madness and poverty in Middlesbrough? Um, that's not just because of the state agencies, that's actually because it's harder to do. Because these people haven't got our number. They think, oh, it's some person coming from a long way off to make a film about us. How wonderful. Whereas in Middlesbrough, it'd be like, oh, fuck you, yeah, you're the fucking guardian. Yeah, fuck, you know. It's harder, actually. Yeah. Um, and it's a very good, I mean, it raises that issue, which we haven't, it's not quite the remit tonight, but it's a very good point. It's, it, there's a laziness in journalism about your own backyard, actually, I think. Yeah, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't get through a front door here with a camera. Uh, I've shown, uh, last year I showed it at the Maudsley because one of the, the crowd funders uh, works in mental health. So he organised a screening there. And he said, he, he donated to the film because he said, really? we just don't have footage of people in this kind of state. How fascinating. What was it like in the Maudsley showing it? Um, well, unfortunately, um, the, the hospital didn't get behind it enough. Um, surprise, but there were, there were some uh, recovering addicts in the audience and they... Yeah, they loved it. They were fascinated by it, you know. But we didn't get enough um, mental health people involved. Oh, interesting. But there, there is more to come of that mm. kind of but stuff. But it raises some crucial issues. Questions? Um, uh, just a quick question. Where, where does the food come? Where's the finance? Where is there anyone beside Josue day-to-day -day in charge on the ground there and where does the food come from and who is it the church that's paying uh, no it's not the church um, there, there are about I don't know I'd say roughly about 10 people who, who manage it they're all ex-patients thing about Josue is that he was never actually insane as such uh, and so once he'd recovered from uh, 
from his heroin addiction and from you know having to pull his fingers off and everything else, um, his mind is actually quite intact. Um, whereas some other people have they've either damaged their minds or they have mental health problems that they've had all their lives. Uh, so there's but are they kind of rich donors? Or, I mean, are they? I mean, it's not. It's. it's I mean, the, the evangelical. But it's not. It's not Catholic, by the way. The person, no, the pastor, no, is, is evangelical. He person. uses. He uses Jesus um, as as a, as a kind of spanner to le leverage money out of people. There's also um, there's a lot of people in Mexico, especially criminals, who uh, are desperate for redemption because they're getting a bit worried that perhaps they've murdered too many people that they might not go to heaven. So pastor comes in handy to relieve them of their sins. Uh, and then they will give him money. Um, so th this is the economy. Food gets donated. But I went to one trip there where I went to a butcher's and they were donating meat. But the, the butcher's was um, this place fortified with razor wire and electric fences. And I asked the guy, like, well, so what's going on here? What, why do you have to have so much, so much protection? And he said, oh, because about a year ago somebody came here and they said they wanted uh, a payment every week protection money and if 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 he doesn't give it then uh, they're gonna murder the guy and the guy said well I'm not gonna pay you so he started he had to get all that security the guy still hasn't come back but he said well he will eventually come back so it's amazing that people like that under those conditions still feel it generous enough that they can they can donate food like that and even the pastor you see the scene with the the girl who's come who's been raped who can't stop crying and mm. she gets that kind of shock therapy. And then when they leave, um, the, that family who are very, very poor, um, they get given food. So even the asylum itself gives food to people. You know? so. Up the back. Hi, Mark. Um, two prosaic questions uh, about uh, filmmaking rather than the politics of the things. But first of all, can I just say thank you for respecting the audience because you kind of didn't give anything easy. Um, you know, you waited for the story to unfold. So, so we're looking at scenes of the desert and it's a blue sky and the sun's shining, so you assume it's warm, but then, you know, you see dead bodies coming out and they're frozen to death. So. It's a bit, you know, it took a while to work that out. And, and actually, there were lots of little subplots like that going all the way through that you had to, had to pay attention to. And uh, you, you got rewarded for paying attention because uh, you got an answer later on. Um, so thank you for that. Um, but <laughs> having said that, um, I was wondering why you didn't locate uh, where your film was. So you've got no map, you've no idea, you know, unless you know the kind of geography of the area, you don't actually know where this place is. Uh, so, but I think you probably already answered that because it's about borderlands and about it actually being here as well as there. Uh, but I'd be still interested to know why you didn't locate it. And the other one is, weren't you ever worried that the uh, reunion with the father and daughter would kind of unbalance the film itself? Because it's such a, I mean, it's a classic kind of documentary feel-good story that you know it's just waiting isn't it you know uh, for the the music and you know the sequel to come up and they're selling it to hollywood and all that and it's all it's just primed perfectly for that and yet you didn't bother with that so um can you just talk about those two things uh well firstly the um the the, the contextualizing the asylum with juarez was difficult um i had one idea where i wanted to film some police or somebody bringing somebody to the place from Juarez, so we actually physically did made that journey. Um, that didn't happen for various reasons, got sabotaged. Um, but you do, there is a, 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 a caption at the beginning when you first see the asylum that says, Refuge for the Mentally Incapacitated, Chihuahua and Desert, Juarez. Um, and then uh, when Josue drives to Juarez, when you get there, you see. I put you get a wide shot and you see Juarez. So uh, maybe you missed that, maybe you didn't get through, but it's it's there. Um, not to be argumentative, but I'm I'm very aware of what you're saying. Um, so we we that's how we dealt with it. Uh, and secondly, was yeah, a bigger answer. The, the the question of Vanessa was was very difficult because 
when I was trying to raise money for the film a few years ago in Sheffield, um, somebody said to me, "Oh, why don't you, why don't you tell funders that um, the guy gets reunited with his family?" And I said, "Well, it's not true." And she said, "It doesn't matter. Just lie to them, and they'll give you the money." So I said, well, I, I can't, I can't, because it's not going to happen, and I can't go to California and try and find this woman, because it's, California's a big place. So, and then literally a month later, she emails me and says, what's my father doing in this video? Um, so it did happen, so I should have lied to them, but the fact is, is that even with uh, the daughter finding him and this, and this heartwarming story, um, funders were still turning me down. You know, um, there's an outfit called Brit Doc, um, who filmmakers will know of. Um, they're not that big. They look bigger than they are. They're not that. They don't have that much money. But they said there was no story. First of all, and then secondly, when after the daughter appeared, I uh, reapplied, and they still said there was no story. You know, so I don't know why they say that, because there clearly is a story. There's much more than one story. But so it's, it's some kind of opaque excuse as to why they didn't want to get involved. But I, I was, the thing with Vanessa, I, I went to LA to meet her because I felt like I needed to instill her trust um, if I was going to get her together with her father. And I filmed her in, in LA watching the video that she saw on YouTube and then before she emailed me. But she had this very um, LA, in, in, in San Francisco, this raised a laugh when I said, oh, she had this kind of um, L.A. mediated emotion, this mediated melodramatic emotion, and all the San Franciscans laughed, because obviously they, they will sneer at L.A. Um, but, but she did. I mean, she, it, was like, it was like daytime TV. And ultimately, the reason why I cut her down, and, and, she, and that, that stuff from L.A. was the last thing to go in the edit, <laughs> The editor didn't agree with me, but I, I, it's the one thing I, over, I overrode and I said, no, it just doesn't work because it, it was like a TV show and the rest of it was more like a film in that you had to work it out. Whereas the TV show, you get told how to feel and that's what she was doing. And I thought, well, there's a big difference between TV and films is you get told how to feel. Although a lot of films do that as well, but I think, I think an interesting film, you work it out. You don't get told what's going on all the time. But by coming back to the to Juarez at the end, you make it a kind of film within a film, really. I mean, if it had ended in, in yeah. the motel, I think you know it would have been perhaps a little over the. And se secondly, too, too schizophrenic. But you, but she, she uh, I was going to show her in L.A. before he saw her, and that was a contrivance, obviously. So we see her before he sees her, and I thought, no, let's see her mm. when he sees her, when he's waiting behind that hotel door. And, he's, and that was the first time they saw each other. And I thought that makes more sense. And the emotion she, she, she expresses when she cries and then she pulls herself together, I thought that was the most truthful emotion she expressed, rather than her telling us how she felt. And she did cry. I mean, her backstory is absolutely tragic. She, uh, her grandfather died of heroin addiction. Her stepfather, also a heroin addict, was in prison when I, when I uh, met her. And her real father, Josue, well, you know about his life. So, and she wasn't bitter. But cheeky question. Sorry if I may interrupt all of you. So, Josue's life in LA in the gangs is quite interesting and quite, well, quite colourful. Um, did we you did drive-by shootings, you know. I mean... But did you leave that out? Why did you... Why did, sorry, it just sounds much more combative than, I, than, than, than it is. But Josue's kind of dodgy past, if you like, I think rather interestingly, you know, you didn't want that in the film particularly. Is that because it would have been too much narration from him and you couldn't see it? Uh, I mean, I had it all. I had it coming from him. I had it coming from his ex-wife. Well, they would, never got married, but his ex-partner, Vanessa's mother. Oh, really? Yeah, I had it, but it, was, it wasn't necessary. And this is the problem with films, is that you, you have one story and it's really just got to flow. Mm. And with another editor or another director, it would have been a different film, but that's what we came out mm. with. I mean, like, there was one point when, when no, I think right. Rye, the yeah. Italian channel, like their BBC, were going to invest in the film and a production company here screwed it up. But um, uh, they were fascinated with uh, the fact that Josue had done time with Charles Manson. They were obsessed with this. It had to be in the film. 
And it's actually not important. You don't need no, to know exactly. that. It's, a, it's kind of a little sideline, you know, and it's because... Good sideline. They, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, they, but it's the currency of Charles Manson, but for Christ's sake, you know, is that more important than, than Hosway? It's not, actually. So, uh, but yeah, it's just this... All these different I came stories. to exactly the same decision. By the way. <laughs> yeah. Now, how are we for time? Sir, so, the one quick question falls to you, unless we get extra time from the fourth official. Thanks. Um, it sort of touches on one of the last questions, but in a different way. The, um, the daughter of, of your Sikh. So was that something which you knew was going to develop, or was it something which was uh, a, a gift from God that you weren't expecting? And if it was, did it concern you that it might change the nature of the film you were making? Well, oh, that's a good question. Um, it was a very mixed blessing because after the first visit, I shot 30 hours, and it was just observational, a day in the life of this place. I cut it, I cut an hour, and actually I was quite happy with it. I thought, this is really strange, this is otherworldly. I could, uh, I know a lot of musicians, I could put, put some music together with this. This could be one of those very off-kilter films. Um, I showed it to some people, everybody kind of thought, what is this? Nobody knew what was going on, nobody, uh, and I thought, hmm, there's, there's just too many questions here. And I felt a certain responsibility with the place, but I didn't want to explain it. I thought explaining it was going to kill it, like the Wellcome Trust, a big um, charity here, pharmaceutical-based charity. They said, oh, you need, uh, you need to have someone like Stephen Fry narrating it. <laughs> and I thought, no, 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 no. You just, as much as I, I admire Stephen Fry, and he's a smart man, but I, 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 he just yeah. didn't somehow fit in this Mexican asylum, or any other expert <laughs> as such. So it's, I thought make, I needed... You couldn't make then, it up. You are joking. And then Chuck, I'm not. And then Chuck oh, Bowden said, because uh, Chuck, Chuck got it right from the start. I sent him clips, and, and, and that was the start of our collaboration on this. And he said, Mark, I, you know, I love what you've done, but I, I think you're going to need some sort of story, you know, um, because it's, it's hard to get through this. And he, he, I mean, he was right, but I was quite annoyed that he said that because I knew then I had to follow that line. And just before I left on the first shoot, I started interviewing Jose. And when I say interview, I mean, I just got him to tell stories with a microphone, no camera. And then I realized he was so poetic. And a lot of the stuff just comes from one night. A lot of the voiceover, when he talks about, um, you know, I want to go deeper into the desert. Um, and, I, you know, I was a liar, I, I was a thief. I, I love everything. my blood. Yeah, I love my blood. Yeah. All these lines just came out of him. And I thought, mm. hold on a minute, this guy is a poet. And uh, he's extremely reflective. His heart is wide open. I haven't got any choice. Um, and then I, on the second shoot, I went back and I thought, right, now I've got to make a story and I've Hosway's got to be our guide to this place so I filmed him working with other people and then and then there still wasn't enough and then after that shoot then the daughter appeared then I had to get them together and then on the third shoot in two weeks six people died so then I had all this action stuff going on death and police and ambulances and forensics um, and the, it was it was the middle of winter so it was a completely different atmosphere and then I yeah so the story just kept evolving but um, yeah I think it's it's much better for, so for called, him you called him a, a, a poet he is a poet I completely agree with yeah. what I was thinking as I was listening to him was that you couldn't beat that with the finest Exactly. <laughs> it's so minimal but clear and um, just got to the root of, of, of the idea in his head. I think he's, he's, he's another Brando, you know. There's a shot, and I don't mean that, I mean, I'm, I'm going to say that with a smile on my face, but there's a shot where he's getting his nails clipped, which I put in just before he goes to see his daughter, and he's sort of smiling, and he's got this Brando esque feel about him. And I said, when I saw him a few weeks ago, I said, you just, you. I don't know if you appreciate what an amazing collaborator he, he, he is, you know. I mean, a lot of those scenes he directed because I couldn't understand what was going on. My Spanish isn't that good. 
And, and also, in the third shoot, I was really ill. So I had to somehow wobble around with this camera. And he took over. <coughs> An amazing man. I mean, it just shows. I was talking to somebody earlier before the screening. We, we, we all have this amazing potential in us. And some of us are lucky enough to be nurtured and encouraged and educated to, to fulfill that. But then there's all these people who get distracted by drugs or whatever and end up going down the sewer or, you know, end up on the streets or whatever. But he's such a great example of somebody who did all that, somehow looked in the mirror, it didn't crack for once, saw something worthwhile, and now he's, he's done this. And look at, look at it. He could be so many things. I mean, the reality is, he's actually, he is scared to leave that place because I don't, he knows that the world out there hasn't got anything for him. So he can actually fulfill his potential there. But he could be an actor, he could be a poet. So he's utterly inspiring, you know? Well, if that ain't redemption, what is? Thank you. Mark. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and you've made my. Um... <laughs> made my job. Made, made my job in, in bringing the proceedings to a close much easier because I have a sort of sad equivalent kind of verbal credits of my own. Um, one is to our mutual friend Molly Malloy, um, Charles Bowden's widow, who um, is the only person who's actually tracing everything that happens in Ciudad Juarez and has done for a very long time. I do urge you to look up, to, to, to register, and if you're interested in all this, to, to get onto something called the Fronteriza list. Fronteriza, the Spanish word, it's easily found. It's, it's, a, it's a superb um, daily, almost, or often more than daily, supply of information on Ciudad Juarez, this extraordinary city um, that Molly, um, who has helped both of us enormously, does. Second kind of verbal credit is to the wonderful Pastor Galvan, who you saw sort of with his paintings and things, and with, you know, who established the place. You know, if it's a chain or he stays in Juarez, doesn't really matter, he's extraordinary. And lastly, to, to Josue himself. Who would have thought it that, um, that uh, we'd be here tonight watching him and listening to him and talking about him in the way we are? And Chuck. Um, and, and, well, we've done him, but Charles certainly, yeah, well, it's, you know, hopefully enjoying a whiskey up there with us tonight. So um, thank you all for coming. And um, you know, I, I, watching that film, I realized I wasn't crazy to go for my holidays in Ciudad Juarez. Um, <laughs> it is now quiet for reasons which are very scary and we won't go into. Do go there. If you're ever in the neighborhood, don't be put off by, by what you've read or heard. If I can jump in. in. The film. It's great. So yeah. thank you for coming and thank you, Mark, for a magnificent. <laughs> thank you. Well, Julian, Mark, um, if anybody wants to learn more about the film or is interested in booking a screening, where would be the best place to look or, or to get in touch? Uh, just a very simple. Go to deadwhenigothere.org. Uh, you can subscribe. If you've written your email down, I'll put you on the mailing list. There's going to be a DVD. with. There's so much that didn't make this cut because it's not Hosway's story. So many amazing interviews with patients and um, and you know if you're interested in behavior that's very out there or <laughs> mental health however you want to describe it it's it's just fascinating material and it's not stuff that people have access to film so um, it's very unusual to get footage like this there's not that many films that have been made of mental asylums let alone ones run by their own patients so the DVD is coming I've written a book and um, Please, if you're interested in screening it or you know anyone, uh, if you know festivals, broadcasters, so on and so forth, um, please get in touch. And thanks, all the familiar faces, thank you because I know quite a few of you donated money to the film. Thank you very much for coming. Of course, you will be getting your DVD and the book and everything <laughs> sent to you when it's done, so uh, you won't be obliged to stump up for that. So. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Aitken, Josue and Pastor Galba.